Okay, so today's video is going to be a little bit controversial. If you're a diehard fan of using study techniques like active recall and spaced repetition to memorize facts, because if you think those techniques and that way of approaching learning works best, then you're probably kind of wrong. And I'm going to explain why. For those of you new to the channel, my name is Alex. I'm a surgeon and the founder of a few edtech companies, and I also have a degree in education and I'm obsessed with learning in the most efficient and effective way possible. If you search YouTube for evidence-based study techniques, you'll be presented with loads and loads of videos on active recall and spaced repetition from students and learning experts, and it makes it seem as though these are the only learning techniques that you need. And if you use them, you'll definitely ace your exams and learn effectively. The problem is that the sheer volume of videos and opinions means it can be super confusing to actually know how to apply these learning techniques to your own studies and to actually understand when to use them. So before we understand why active recall and spaced repetition don't always work as well as people hype them up to, we need to first understand a little bit about how learning actually works in the first place. Then we're gonna look at something called cognitive load theory and then we're gonna look at where active recall and spacing actually fit in to give you the results you want with some practical tips at the end, focusing on how to actually apply these strategies to get the best grades and spend less time working. If you want to get top grades, boost your learning ability and learn more in less time, do hit that subscribe button and let's get into things, starting with a short story to illustrate the problem with active recall and spacing and some of the confusion it causes people. So when I was at medical school, I went on a bit of a learning journey from unconscious incompetence in first year, where I just read, highlight and cram my learning to the point that I failed an exam, to conscious competence, where I was coming top in the year and spending minimal time actually in the library as I taught myself the science behind effective learning techniques. And by the time I'd mastered how to learn efficiently using the techniques that we'll discuss shortly, many of my friends were still spending hours and hours in the library. I remember one of my friends would use active recall with flashcards and try to use spacing because he just watched a YouTube video or something similar, but he was still spending like 12 hours in the library straight trying to memorize everything in his medical textbooks. At exam time, he was super strung out and looked absolutely terrible because he'd been studying so hard and then because he didn't do as well as he thought he might despite having used these hyped up techniques, he ended up asking me how I studied as he knew I didn't really go to the library very much, but had done pretty well. When he told me his actual interpretation of how to use active recall, it kind of clicked for me that lots of people don't really understand how to apply active recall and how it fits into learning as a whole. Now, active recall is proven by science to be better than simply reading or highlighting, but if you're just memorizing an entire textbook, that's completely wrong. And this is potentiated by people on YouTube jumping onto trending terms without really understanding how to apply it themselves. So a bit like evolving from a cave person, our understanding of how to learn effectively has to go on a bit of a journey. And the reason I say that is because if you're watching this video and you're currently reading your notes or highlighting things passively, then active recall and spacing are actually a great place to start. But to understand how to use them to learn effectively, let's simplify things and look at what learning actually means and how our brains learn. So let's start with the difference between the terms learning, studying, and memory. The first thing I wanna point out is that studying is not the same thing as learning. And this may be something that's really obvious to you, but I found that a lot of people haven't even thought about this, and loads of YouTube videos kind of mix and match terminology. Studying is actually the physical process that we do. It could be writing your notes when you're in class or revising material. It could be us watching a video or something like that. Right now, you might be studying this video as you're listening. It's the stuff we do in the physical world and the purpose of doing this is really to produce learning. And learning is the actual cognitive process that occurs and is essentially when information is connected into our brain. We can say that we've successfully learned something if that knowledge is retained in our memory and we can recall what we've learned and then apply that knowledge. So studying causes learning, which is the process that forms and allows us to recall from our brain's memory. So now we've got that down, let's look at how our brains actually form memories and the cognitive process of learning in a little bit more detail before we dive into why encoding and cognitive load are so important. So memory is our ability to take in information, store it and recall it at a later time. 
The concept of memory storage was analyzed by American psychologists, including George Miller in the 1950s, who developed something called information processing theory, which is a cognitive theory that focuses on how information is processed into our memory. The theory describes how our brains filter information from what we're paying attention to in the present moment to what gets stored in our short-term memory or working memory and ultimately then goes into our long-term memory. The premise of information processing theory is that creating a long-term memory is something that happens in stages. Firstly, we perceive something through our sensory memory, which is everything we can see, hear, feel or taste in a given moment. In order for sensory input to then enter our short-term memory, we have to deem it relevant. And this is where attention comes into play. We have to pay attention and ensure things are relevant. Our short-term memory is then what we use to remember things for short periods, like a phone number. And long-term memory is stored permanently into our brains. Now, Miller suggested that human short-term memory can hold approximately seven chunks of information for around five to 15 seconds. And more recent research has shown that this number is roughly accurate for college students recalling lists of digits, but memory can actually vary widely with populations tested and with the materials being remembered. Rehearsal is the process in which information is kept in short-term memory by mentally repeating it. When the information is repeated each time, that information is re-entered into short-term memory and so keeps the information there for another 5 to 15 seconds. Now to keep things simple, I'm going to consider the term working memory to be exactly the same as short-term memory, since it pretty much is, but I'll be diving into how working memory functions as a distinct part of short-term memory in a future video, so do hit that subscribe button if you're interested to hear about that first. So now we've looked at how information gets into our short-term memory, let's look at the key part for learning, which is how we actually store things to our long-term memory. The process of transferring information from short-term to long-term memory involves encoding and consolidation of information. This is really a function of time. The longer the memory stays in the short-term section, the more likely it is to be placed into our long-term part. In this process, the meaningfulness or emotional content of an item may play a greater role in its retention into that long-term memory. Unlike sensory and short-term, long-term memory has a theoretically infinite capacity and information can really remain there indefinitely. In educational psychology, memory creation is then further broken down into three stages, encoding, storage, and retrieval. And as a quick refresher, encoding is the process of receiving, processing, and combining information. Storage is the creation of a permanent record of that encoded information. And retrieval or recall is the calling back of stored information in response to some kind of cue for use in a process or activity like a test or an exam. Now, as we know from the work of Herman Ebinghaus and his forgetting curve, our memories and what we've learned gradually deteriorate with time. And he showed that using active recall and spaced repetition reduces the effects of memory deterioration. But that's just a small portion of the picture, since retrieval is also impacted by how the information is encoded into our memories in the first place. The process of encoding happens in our short-term or working memory, and how well we encode information is dependent on a few factors. And this is where something called cognitive load theory comes into its own. And this is what I really want to focus down on, since quality active recall and spacing are dependent on encoding, which is all about our short-term memory, which has a limited capacity and only receives sensory input that we pay attention to. So cognitive load theory looks at the way that we consider short-term memory while learning complex concepts or solving problems. And to explain it, let's use a worked example going through the steps of memory we've just covered. When you see something, hear something, or take in any type of information through your senses, it enters what psychologists call sensory memory. And from here, your brain quickly filters out information that's irrelevant. Let's take the example of me being lazy intentionally and devoting my focus to a video game as an example. The sound outside or the smell of food cooking in the kitchen is forgotten and the information that's relevant goes into my working memory as my attention is on playing a game like Elden Ring or Zelda. Now, once the information has moved to your working memory, your brain begins to process it or decides to forget it and the ultimate goal is to store the information into your long-term memory. Psychologists believe that within long-term memory are structures of information hierarchies called schema, and they help to relate new pieces of information to existing information in your brain. Within the schema of my video game, for example, I may have information about each button on my PS5 controller or the backstory of a specific character, both of which are actually pretty hard and complex in Elden Ring. Now, the first time I used my controller or played a game, information about what each button does was put into my short-term memory. I then rehearsed it by playing the game and worked with the information long enough that it now goes into my long-term memory and I can pick up and remember straight away. 
it's then easy to retrieve every time you pick up that controller. But not all information that's important ends up going from short-term memory to your long-term memory. So why is that? Well, in some cases, it's because you're overwhelming your short-term memory. And this is exactly what cognitive load theory is all about. So long-term memory is like a computer with unlimited data storage, while short-term memory, on the other hand, can only process a few chunks of information at a time. If we fail to come back to the information in our short-term memory, it'll be forgotten forever. Cognitive load theory suggests that if we want to learn more effectively, we must keep this limit in mind and only load up a few pieces of information into our short term at a time. If we overload our short term memory, we'll be more likely to forget and won't connect that information that we're trying to learn. And this is why people who spend ages in the library, even if they're using study techniques like active recall, probably aren't learning as efficiently as they could be. Now, our age and development influence how much of a cognitive load an individual can take on at once, but in general, the simpler the information is, the easier it will be to process and store in our long-term memory. John Sweller, the creator of the cognitive load theory, also did a lot of work to describe the different types of cognitive load, and learners and teachers can construct learning materials and lessons to lighten the load and help people to learn more efficiently and effectively. So now we know some basics about cognitive load, let's dive a little deeper into the three different types of cognitive load and look at how we can optimize each when learning to learn more effectively than pretty much anyone else. So intrinsic cognitive load means the burden imposed on short-term memory by the difficulty of the material. In other words, simple topics require little processing capacity in short-term memory and complex topics demand a large amount of space. For example, the theory of cognitive load has a little bit more of an intrinsic cognitive load than say a mathematical fact like four times four equals 16. Now, when learning, we can't really impact how complex a topic is, but we can chunk up information and start with the simplest elements first to speed up how our brains process the information. Remember, small chunks are good for our short-term memory, which has a limited capacity. When learning a language, you first learn the alphabet and then proceed to learn simple words or phrases. But you're not proficient in a language unless you can understand its complex prose. This is an example of something called element interactivity, which basically means the complexity of what we're learning due to the levels of connectedness that depend on the type of information and the learner's prior knowledge. It stems from the number of elements that must be simultaneously processed in our working memory. In our language example, because understanding prose depends upon not only understanding its nouns, verbs, adverbs, but also about how each of them modifies or alters the meaning of other words nearby, this is element interactivity. So we want to minimize intrinsic cognitive load by simplifying complex topics into bite-sized chunks and building up that complexity. And this is another example of how if people are using active recall are just memorizing facts and information that isn't directly relevant to building a deeper understanding of complexity, they're probably not going to be able to then apply that knowledge because even though active recall is way better than just reading or highlighting, if you're not using active recall to actually test your application of more complex topics, you're not actually learning properly. For example, if you only learn words but never practice putting them into sentences, you're never gonna deeply learn a language. Next up, we have something called extraneous cognitive load, which is essentially information not relevant to what you're learning. And this is all about the method in which the information is taught to you, and is really about limiting anything that isn't directly relevant to what you want to learn. So if you keep getting distracted by external information, or the method of learning is ineffective, this increases extraneous cognitive load. And the goal of teachers, whether they know it or not, is to reduce extraneous cognitive load and communicate information in a simple and effective way. When a learner's working memory becomes clogged up by unnecessary information, they may remember the irrelevant stuff and forget what they actually need to know. And this is something called the redundancy effect, and it often hinders learning due to inefficient use of short-term memory resources. If you're teaching people, this means reducing the unnecessary cognitive load of redundant information for learners and focusing on what matters most. Equally, having to receive information alternatively from two or more sources can place a burden on short-term memory as focus is being spread too thinly. And this is something called the split attention effect, which basically means that switching between two different sources can lead to learners remembering less content because their energy and resources are spent trying to process several different things at the same time. Research from learning psychologists in Germany shows that people who learned in a split source format achieved lower learning outcomes than their peers who learned in an integrated one. As an example, let's look at two ways you can learn a simple fact like remembering the Great Lakes in America. 
One way of learning these might be to use an acronym or a mnemonic like HOMES, where H is for Huron, O is for Ontario, M is Michigan, E is Erie, and S is for Superior. A second method might be to look at an actual map and try to learn from that. Obviously, the first method is going to have a lot less cognitive load as it uses a mnemonic aid and it's easier to remember and the information is already organized for our brains as the structure around using the word HOMES and people who learn this will commit it to their long-term memory faster as it's got a lower extraneous cognitive load than learning from a map with distracting information like other place names. So basically anything irrelevant to what you're learning needs to go and this is why it's so important that before you just start going through a textbook, video or lectures from A to Z using active recall, you actually spend time understanding what the core concepts are, what's likely to be used regularly or tested and what just isn't that important. We want to reduce extraneous cognitive load as this will keep you efficient when learning, save time in coding and ensure active recall is focused on learning what actually matters rather than clogging up your brain with stuff that just isn't relevant. Now the third and final type of cognitive load is called germane cognitive load. And this type of load occurs when we're creating a new schema for this concept and we relate it to existing knowledge. Schema are structures which hold and organize information. So let's say you enter an operating theater with no prior knowledge of surgery. One surgeon starts the operation by asking you for your current level of understanding, introduces you to all the surgical instruments, who everybody is, what you can touch and what you can't, and the reason for the actual operation in the first place. Now let's take a second surgeon who dives straight into the same procedure asking you to grab instruments that you're unfamiliar with and talking about brand new concepts in detail. That second surgeon is increasing your cognitive load as you've got to play catch up as you attempt to build a more complex schema with information that you don't already have in your long-term memory. And it's putting pressure on you and just basically overloading your brain. We want to maximize schema creation and linking new information to existing concepts to help our brains encode efficiently and to also then become more adept at recalling this information from the schema. So again, if you're not spending time to organize what you're learning and just memorizing facts from book chapters, you're going to overload your brain and 12 hours in the library won't be producing quality learning that you can recall easily. So now we've looked at just why cognitive load kills the hype of active recall and spacing when you understand the science, Let's look at how to optimize our cognitive load and encode efficiently so that when we do use active recall and spacing to make learning stick, we're doing it as efficiently and effectively as possible. So our main goal is to simplify the difficulty of the information, reduce irrelevant information, and maximize how we organize new content and link it to what we already know to encode. And the goal here is to select processing strategies that will increase the likelihood of a learner recalling new information at a later point in time. So here are five strategies I use to make sure I'm actually understanding what I'm learning and I'm encoding efficiently. So tip one is to activate your prior knowledge. One of the most important cognitive principles is the importance of relating information from long-term memory to information newly entering the system. If you're starting a study session, going over existing knowledge at the start through self-testing is a must for reminding you where new content will fit in. For teachers and trainers, any good lesson plan begins the class with some form of prior knowledge activation. It might be a reminder or a brief review of what was studied in the previous day's lesson. Or it could be a question similar to, can you remember what the problem you solved yesterday was? The purpose of the phase of learning is to activate prior knowledge, to bring back long-term memories back into the short term so that new knowledge can be connected with old with the result of more solid understanding of that new information. If you're starting a revision session, go back over your previous day's learning. Tip two is to focus on organizing what you're learning. Skim reading through a new topic, reading the course curriculum, and grouping together new information will help organize things in a more meaningful way. In simple terms, just organizing where your notes or active recall questions are stored on your computer or organizing study sessions by topics in your calendar are ways you probably naturally organize things without consciously knowing that spending time organizing is actually really, really vital to learning. And this also works as a basic memory strategy in everyday life. Think about your last visit to the shops or the shopping list. Instead of using a randomly ordered list, try grouping things together by meal or things like vegetables and then link this to the aisles in the supermarket as a mental cue to aid you. Tip three is all about deeply processing what you're learning. It's easy to become convinced that spending all day, every day studying for an exam, that you'll then ace that exam. However, cognitive studies show that it's not specifically the time you spend studying that matters the most, but how you actually spend that time studying. For example, jumping back to my friend at medical school, 
His exam preparation strategy was using flashcards with active recall. He'd take terms from the textbook or lectures, write them down on flashcards, and then rehearse them until he had those flashcards memorized. He was convinced that he knew loads and loads, but the problem with his approach to learning is that he only had surface level processing of that material rather than deep processing. His learning was surface level because he'd memorized terms and definitions rather than truly understanding the meaning and applications of those concepts. So when he needed to apply that knowledge, he just couldn't do it. Deep processing occurs when we use something called elaborative rehearsal to connect a concept to other concepts that we already know or are learning. Basically, rather than just rote learning flashcards, it involves thinking about the meaning of the information you're learning and connecting it to other information already stored in your memory. For example, I sometimes write a summary of a concept in my own words to check my comprehension, following the Feynman technique of being able to explain things in simple terms and relating it back to my own experiences. Another approach to facilitate deep processing is to think of examples of the newly learned concepts and apply them to things and experiences from your own life. So in medicine, you might think back to a clinical case you've seen if you're learning about a specific new sign or symptom. The point is, learning that comes from surface level processing is not durable. People just don't remember the content of flashcards for very long after an exam. But spending the same amount of time, or even less time, meaningfully engage with new content can result in learning that can last you forever. Tip four is to focus on distributing your learning. To be the most effective learner, you need to space out or distribute your learning over a time period. Attempting to cram a lot of learning into one or two concentrated study sessions rarely works, as shown by Herman Ebinghaus's work on the forgetting curve. But even before we get to recalling information and spacing it, making sure that your learning sessions are broken down and you're staying focused and engaged is absolutely essential. Taking breaks and doing things like exercise and getting a good night's sleep rather than doing like my friend did and staying up all night to learn, also helps to aid memory consolidation, which is the biological process by which memories are created and is impacted by sleep and our general health. Tip five is about scaffolding and impacts intrinsic cognitive load by gradually introducing your brain to more complex topics, just like putting the training wheels on a bike. If you're starting off learning a complex topic, your brain will benefit from scaffolding, such as using worked examples. When a problem has been solved and each step that leads to that solution has been thoroughly explained, or in medicine or languages, watching a video of an expert walk you through the steps will reduce your cognitive load and actually help you to understand how knowledge comes together in its application. And that's true of learning how to learn too. So don't worry, I'll be screen sharing how I do all of this in detail and how I apply all of the concepts. So do hit that subscribe button to see when those videos drop. Now, once you've mastered worked examples, we want to follow our earlier advice on chunking up intrinsic load and introducing more complexity. Doing things like completion tasks where some of the problem is shown, but you need to apply basic knowledge are similar to worked examples, but are only partially completed and you need to finish off the rest of the solution. This provides you with some structure so you don't get overloaded, but you still need to stretch your knowledge. Once these are mastered, you can then get absolutely crazy on complex active recall questions that apply knowledge and you need to solve problems independently. For me, when I skim through a lecture, video or textbook or question bank, I'll look for worked examples and then ensure the active recall questions I'm creating actually test my deeper level understanding. Now a final bonus tip here to optimize cognitive load and encoding is all about understanding that the mind processes visual and auditory information separately. Auditory items in your short-term memory don't compete with visual items in the same way that two visual things do, for example, a picture and some text, which are both visual. This is something called the modality effect. So for example, explanatory information has less impact on working memory if it's narrated rather than added to an already complex diagram. So you might want to mix these up and integrate audio and visual learning so that your brain doesn't get overloaded. And so to wrap things up and summarize, we can only process so much information at once. And if you jump in and start actively recalling flashcard facts, you're going to overload your brain and you'll also miss out on actually understanding a topic and applying it to your long-term memory. Active recall and spacing are awesome and way better than just reading things passively, but too much information can lead to cognitive overload, which can affect the transfer into your long-term memory. Reducing this when possible is important to maximize your learning efficiency and remembering the information for years to come. Now, I hope you found this video useful. It was pretty epic to research and I deliberately used examples and stories to help get across some really complex topics. I'll be going into how I apply these concepts in really practical terms in the next few videos. So do hit that subscribe button to get those first. And do let me know if you've got any suggestions for other topics you'd like to see covered 
in the comments below. I'll also pop up links to the evidence-based learning series in the end cards here. I hope you have a great day and remember to learn efficiently and effectively and to stay productive. And I'll catch you again in the next video.